Tampa Bay Rays have some major questions about their future because their stadium likely won't be ready for opening day and they're only planning to stay there for another three seasons anyway. We're also speaking to retired stars from the NFL. Plus, we have stories from the WNBA, the NBA, and global soccer. It's Thursday, October 17th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, my colleague Eric Fisher lays out the options for the Tampa Bay Rays, who are suddenly in a very awkward spot regarding where they're going to play. We're also chatting with retired NFL players Jamal Charles and Spice Adams on how the NFL has changed and which players have it easiest. Plus, Jerry Jones attempted to explain why he threatened the jobs of three radio hosts, and Messi hints at retirement. First, here are your headlines. The Las Vegas Sphere is soon to have a twin in Abu Dhabi. The world's second sphere is set to be built in the capital of the United Arab Emirates, according to announcement from Abu Dhabi's Department of Culture and Tourism. The announcement failed to mention any financing information, as well as when and where the sphere will be built in the UAE's capital. The WNBA and its players' union have until November 1st to opt out of their current collective bargaining agreement, should they choose to do so. And with record growth in viewership and attendance, it's likely that the players will be opting out in order to bargain for a bigger piece of the financial pie. The players have a list of wants to negotiate for, including increased salaries, now that the league will soon enter an 11-year media rights deal worth $200 million per year. If the players do opt out, they will have a year to come to an agreement with the league. Over to the other basketball league, in 2014, Adam Silver wrote in an op-ed, Betting on professional sports is currently illegal in most of the United States outside of Nevada. I believe we need a different approach. Those two sentences began the movement toward making sports betting mainstream, significantly changing today's sports landscape. Now, 10 years later, Silver has no regrets writing that piece saying, I certainly don't regret writing that op-ed piece and being in favor of legalized sports betting. We had to deal directly with technology and recognize that if we don't legalize sports betting, people are going to find ways to do it illegally. One more NBA note, Jamal Crawford is set to join the New York Knicks broadcast team as a game analyst. Crawford will join MSG Network for about 10 Knicks games this season. The move comes as Crawford is a sought-after free agent on the national scene with interest from multiple networks. Thomas Tuchel was announced as the new manager of England's national soccer team on Wednesday. Tuchel, who admitted that taking charge of England is a step into the unknown, agreed to an 18-month contract to become only the third foreign-born manager of the English team. Tuchel, who's won 11 major honors in his time with Dortmund, PSG, Chelsea, and Bayern Munich, hasn't stayed with one team for more than two years since 2014. Fortunately for England fans, the 2026 World Cup is coming up in just under 20 months. The Tampa Bay Rays will likely not be able to start the 2025 season at Tropicana Field after Hurricane Milton ripped through the roof of the stadium. Mark Tompkin of the Tampa Bay Times reported that while damage is still being assessed, the team will certainly not be able to play at the stadium on opening day. Where will the Rays play in the meantime, and what does this mean for the future of the team? We'll have more on that up next with newsletter writer Eric Fisher. I'm joined now back from Atlanta by newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Good to have you back on in multiple cities. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, the Tampa Bay Rays are, uh, we're, we're starting to understand a little bit more about what their options are. Obviously, uh, things are still unfolding, uh, but it's been about a week since, um, you know, we they, we've we saw the damage from Hurricane Milton to their stadium. What do we know about the viability of Tropicana Field? So that assessment is still going on. It's still a sort of dangerous, kind of treacherous situation as the uh, uh, experts and uh, local authorities uh, assess the damage. Uh, so far, you know, there are a few knowns that um, it's more than just the roof. There are other structural things and then even some minor things like signage, but it's more than the roof. And there are a number of things that are going to have to be addressed. Uh, it's... Uh, we know at this point that it, opening day at the end of March is pretty much a no-go at this point. Um, that has not been officially confirmed, but given that we're dealing with more than just the roof and that there's only five months to play with, that it's going to be time pretty soon to start thinking about new options, at least to start the 2025 season. Yeah, and I, I want to get back to the timing, but let's let's hit on some of those options that they're looking at the Rays are going to need a new home for some amount of time. Where might they end up? So there are a number of options locally. They're not, none of them are really great. And we're going to be talking about the minor league situation that came into play for the Blue Jays during COVID is now coming into play for the uh, A's in Sacramento. Uh, 
you know, those kinds of things because it's not a standard major league facility. Um, it's just going to be a complicated thing. And there's a lot of things to check off between union approval and, and having your staff taken care of and all those sorts of things. But there's their own spring training complex in Port Charlotte. Uh, there's TD Ballpark, which is the Blue Jays spring uh, training complex in Dunedin. That's one of those uh, COVID facilities that the Blue Jays used uh, because of the obvious travel restrictions at the time during the pandemic. Uh you could be potentially looking at ESPN Wide World of Sports in Orlando uh, after Hurricane Ian a couple of years ago. The uh, Rays actually started spring training there, and they've even played uh, going back a uh, decade plus. Uh, even played a few handful of regular season games there. Um, although that facility is very much in demand by youth teams um, as they go on their traveling circuits. Uh, so in all of these facilities, none of them are major league size. They're all open air. So you're dealing with all the vagaries of Florida weather. Uh, so it's not a great situation, but those are kind of the local options. If you really want to sort of rip off the Band-Aid, depending on the severity, once this assessment is done, then you start looking at places outside the area, maybe another bigger market and a bigger facility like a Nashville or even a Montreal. Uh, there's been crazy things thrown out. Even somebody's talking about Oakland. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, so, um, but I would say just for the benefit of their own staff to, you know, run the games and run the organization, um, the players themselves, the coaches and so forth. And of course the fans, I think you start at those Florida based options. Yeah, I've been seeing a, a whole lot of Oakland suggested on, on my social media feeds lately. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's you know, trying to stay a drivable distance from, from where the Rays were so they could, yep. you know, make it easier on their staff and players and their families. Um, and then there's, you know, the sort of close options. Yeah, and then there's things like Nashville. I've seen uh, Raleigh, Durham thrown out yep. there because that's where they have the AAA facility. Um, and, and I guess we're just going to have to see what they pick i mean is there any way to kind of advantage one venue over the other i think it really kind of just depends on how long they're going to be out because if it's just going to be you know two weeks or three weeks makes all the difference you're probably talking about port charlotte something real close that if once they get done with this assessment and they know that they need x amount of work and that by mid to late april say they're going to be fine that favors that kind of situation if it looks like it's really going to be into next summer or even god forbid the entirety of next season that they can't get there then you start looking at these more drastic farther out options that would offer a larger facility yeah. And on that timing part, I think that's kind of the next big question here is, yeah, if this is just like, okay, they need an extra month, they can they can patch it together. No big deal. If it this becomes like a big, long, expensive thing, they're only planning on staying in that stadium for three more seasons. Like, right. is it on the table that they just never go back to Tropicana? I, that would be the more radical option. But again, if that assessment is done and they say that that it's just too great and it's not worth the money and they want to tear it down, that would be a more drastic option. But it, it, once they get in there, could that be a possibility? I would say maybe, but I would I would say that's a more remote option. Um, it is bad as it looked and we've all seen the photos and it's not great it's not like yes the roof is off and there's as i said there's a number of other things that need to get done but it's not like half of the entire facility was just completely leveled either that it does seem like there is some level of integrity within the seating bowl i'm not a structural engineer but um it does look like there's something to work from that would not require just completely sandbagging these final three years. Yeah, makes sense. And finally, and this is getting into speculation, but do you see this having implications for the Rays' new stadium, uh, given that they're staying in the same area? It is a hurricane-prone area. Um, obviously, this roof was prepared for hurricanes, but it wasn't prepared for this one. Yeah, I would say this might require some design tweaks in terms of maybe strengthening up the, the windows and the roof structure that was already sort of built in for, again, the location and climate that they have, as you correctly indicate. But do you stiffen it and tighten that up even more? Probably. Um, I would say the timetable thing is there is some also something that I'm watching in the sense that 
the demand on construction personnel and, and local resources and such as everybody else tries to recover. Um, a new baseball stadium is not the most critical thing that the community needs. Um, so does that get pushed down the line in that opening day 2028? Does that become more like summer 28 or opening day 29? Because other things need to get in front of line in terms of, you know, that kind of uh, resource and construction personnel and so forth. That remains to be seen. And again, that's going to be, that's going to depend on a lot of these assessments, not just at the TROP, but across the region. Um, but over the next year, that timetable for the new ballpark, that also becomes more known, particularly as they're looking to do a groundbreaking next year. Appreciate the insights here, Eric Fisher. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Sure. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones attempted to provide a more level-headed explanation for his tirade against three radio hosts on Tuesday. As we covered yesterday, the hosts were questioning Jones on whether the Cowboys roster is well-constructed, and he responded by threatening their jobs. The Athletic reached out to Jones, who explained, quote, If I'm going to be grilled by the tribunal, I don't need it to be the guys I'm paying. This is one of those times where the explanation is basically just the same point in a calmer voice. Jones still feels like people he's paying should not ask him hard questions. To me, that doesn't sound all that interesting to listen to, but I don't think that's a particular concern for Jones. He went on to say that he can take criticism from fans and people who know what they're talking about, just not these particular hosts. But that's not the same point. If these guys have a Cowboys show and don't know how the NFL works, then sure, that's a problem and maybe they should be replaced. But it sounds like he was fine with them until they gave him a difficult interview. The Cowboys have a PR team. Maybe Jones would, be, would prefer to be interviewed by them. Staying with the NFL, the Buffalo Bills owners could sell a stake in the team to three Toronto sports legends. According to Sportico, Vince Carter and Tracy McGrady of the Toronto Raptors and Josie Altidore, who played for Toronto FC and the U.S. men's national team, are in talks to buy a piece of the NFL team from the Pagula family. Toronto is just a two-hour drive from Buffalo, and it has ten times its population. The Bills played six regular season games there from 2008 to 2013. Establishing a real Toronto connection would help one of the NFL's smallest markets punch above its weight. Over to basketball, TNT is likely losing the NBA after this season, but they are not losing basketball. The network struck a deal with Unrivaled, the three-on-three -three basketball league started by Brianna Stewart and Nafisa Collier, who are battling each other in the WNBA Finals right now. Games will be shown three days a week on TNT Sports and True TV, with every game also streamed on Max. TNT is losing its signature broadcast, but it hasn't given up on sports. Speaking of Stewart, her wife received a threatening homophobic email after the Liberty's Game 1 loss in the finals. There are inherent growing pains and challenges for a league on the rise, and unfortunately, one of those is that a very small percentage of fans think it's fine to be terrible to athletes, and sometimes their families, and athletes are more accessible than ever before. With more exposure comes more situations like this, and I don't want to take it as inevitable, but I also don't know how you stop it. Up next, former NFL players Jamal Charles and Spice Adams join the show to talk about what they've been up to in their post-NFL careers and their takes on today's game. It's a fun conversation with Jamal and Spice bringing a lot of energy, and we're diving straight into that one right now. The first half of your career in San Francisco, what was the biggest mm -hmm. difference between playing in Chicago and playing in SF? Well, in San Francisco, you got a chance to choose, right? You could choose between, at the time, the Oakland Raiders and also San Francisco 49ers. And so that was the, the, the difference in the fan base. Here in Chicago, it's just, it's all Bears. It's 100% Bears. And just like Jamal, like it's, it's the, the, the fans there at Kansas City, they all about their Chiefs. And here in the Bears, they all about the Bears. So... That was the difference. And, um, you know, so you can you can notice that like right away. Like when I got here in March, like it was people who, who knew who I was and I'm a nose guard. You know, usually you don't know who nose guards are, mm -hmm. you know, if they're like, you know, role players and things like that. They knew exactly who I was when I got here with the Bears and it's just been an awesome fan base. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and Jamal, obviously you spent almost all your career in Kansas City. What's it like been seeing that place become the center of the football universe? Man, it's as wild because I remember it's not being as good when we first started. You know, it's winning like one game, two games. And now when you go back to the game as a retired vet, 
uh, retired former players, like many people in out of the country to come here to be games. You see, in that area for the very first time and get the experience, all like the all the winning stuff that you know we, I when I was a part of that you didn't see. So you know, I remember people getting ticks for three dollars. Now you know what I'm saying. So it's like <laughs> it's crazy That's seeing all those people. <laughs> yeah. yeah and jamal you retired about five years ago um are you, have you found your groove in like your post nfl life uh, i'm still finding it you know what I'm saying uh i was able to find it with ty you know what I'm saying just tackling uh ty right now tackling the best in the game right now so right now I'm just you know I, I might have something in the future but you know what i'm saying right now i'm still uh, with the kids with the kiddos and Hanging in there and uh, trying to be the best husband and uh, family man for my my uh, my kids right now. I do a lot of bars and girls club for the community in my hometown. I'm on the board and also uh, do a lot of stuff for Special Olympic. I'm a Special Olympic ambassador and also uh, I just I I do stuff to help kids all the youth programs. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's awesome. And and Spice, you seem to be mm -hmm. enjoying, you know your post NFL life, maybe as much as you did, uh, you know, playing football. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of uh, different things with brands, but nothing like what I'm doing right now with Ty. Uh, this campaign is, is it just, it makes so much sense because as a player, you don't get a chance to, to tailgate and, and, and be out there in the elements with the fans and to, to feel their energy, to feel their excitement about their team and so um, the campaign that I'm doing with Tide, they have a picture of me on the RV, like, you know, with the yellow suit behind the tree, that's on the <laughs> RV. So that's already fun. And, you know, we've been to Buffalo, Kansas City, and New Orleans. And, you know, you get a chance to celebrate all the fans, tailgate rituals and activities, customs and cuisines, and all of this stuff. And through the process, you're going to eat a, a cheeseburger. You're going to eat a hot dog and you're going to get ketchup all over your jerseys or your shirts and things like that. And so you're going to need somebody to tackle the stains. <laughs> so no one cleans better than Tide. And nobody does game day quite like Buffalo or Kansas City or New Orleans, like all the three cities that we went to. And uh, it's been a dope experience, man. And I, I can't yeah. complain over here. Yeah, what's been the most unique thing that you've experienced uh, tailgating in those places? Um, so in Buffalo, and I don't think like I can get past Buffalo. I just can't. Man. It <laughs> was um, a guy. By, if if you type in Pinto in Google, it'll finish your suit. It, it'll finish your sentence. Like, oh, you mean Pinto Ryan? <laughs> so Pinto Ryan makes food on the hood of his Pinto. <laughs> dude I, I cannot make this up dude if you look it up on google man you will see it man pinto ron dude like they had like they were making bacon first of all there was a hubcap in this hubcap was charcoal right so but on top of that was a metal saw and they were cooking bacon on the metal saw like this is well no no, I ain't trying none of that stuff, man. I ain't trying none of that stuff, bro. Well, I, I act like I was. Dude, it was it was uh eight o'clock in the morning, dude. I had to turn down like nine shots. They was like, hey, take a shot with us. I'm like, dude, it is eight. No, it is eight on one. What are y'all doing? It was crazy, man. Um uh, let's get to some football topics. So um I think is the biggest misconception now that you're spending more time with fans the biggest misconception a fan has about the life of an nfl player um that that you've seen man they have no idea <laughs> like how much film we watch like all, all the lifting the weights and getting in the hot tub getting in the cold tub like you just saw christian mccaffrey travel to germany Travel to Germany to see about his Achilles. Like people are traveling all over the world just to get out on the field and play. Like you're seeing massage therapists. You are seeing uh, somebody who does acupuncture. You're seeing chiropractors. Like you're getting like blood taken out of your calf and transferred into your arm. Like all kind of stuff, man, just to get out on the field. So 
fast. Take it easy when you say, oh, mm-hmm. this guy's not good or this guy's that. Like we dealing with car collisions. We yeah. dealing with that. Like every play, like if, if you play 60 plays, that's like getting into 60 mini car accidents. So take it easy on that. Yeah, yeah. and you do a lot to get ready to play football, man. People spend millions yeah. of dollars. To say they spend millions or hundreds of grand to, just to take care of their body, to be back on the yeah. field, even – the next week, you know what I'm saying? It's hard to go through a week and you saw as a running back and you're trying to get back on the field in three more days. So, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, like I said, you got to take it easy because being a, <laughs> a professional football player is not really what y'all think it is. Like, if y'all was walking in these shoes, y'all be ready to go back out the door. Like, y'all can have the out child back. So, you know what I'm saying? Being a mm-hmm. professional player at a high level is really – you know what I'm saying? To stay, especially to stay on top for a long time in the game, you got to take care of your body. Yeah. And it's all that. I mean, you said, Spice, you said like you're like you're getting into 60 mini car crashes every game. Is mm-hmm. that I mean, should the league change anything to, you know, lessen those car crashes or is it that that's just the NFL? And that's that's how it is and should be. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a necessary evil, man. That's what you got to go through, man. Like that's football. It's a It's a contact sport. Like there's there's nothing you can do to try to eliminate that like you I mean if you think about a safety that's coming from his position and a running back coming from his position and two of them meet each other in the alley like you're talking about like 20 yards that a dude is just running as fast as he can into somebody else like there's no regards for your body like and that's what makes it so beautiful like it's a but that's why you know, you you can go to the Coliseum and you see somebody out there like we like modern day gladiators. Yeah, but like it's true. But like, uh, oh man, I feel like you really in the moment as a kid, you don't really pay attention to, to none of those things. Mm-hmm. You don't really, you know what I'm saying you just out there just having fun, mama cheering you on, family cheering you on, and it just leads up to the next you know what I'm saying, middle school, and you just you just out there with friends, and you it leads up to high school, so you really don't really understand the mm-hmm. whole behind it until you get really out the league. <laughs> because yeah, once uh-huh. you're in it, you're in it the, the, your body move, and you got a talent that, that people have been telling you, you've been awesome all your life, and you've been great, you've been incredible, and, you, and, and it goes to another level, and people like seeing that, and you're getting paid to do it. Yeah. And, once, once you stop, it just don't even, it's, it just, it just look, it doesn't look the same. Once you in it, you in it. And that's why people do, does it and love it. Yeah. Which position on the field do you think has the best quality of life of, of any of them? Offense, defense. <laughs> long snapper. Uh, a kicker. <laughs> yeah. <snapper>. A kicker. <laughs> a long snapper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you got to <laughs> long yeah, snapper. Or once Only... a season, you have to tackle the guy who like made it all the way in a run back. But no, like some of the you kick. Yeah, long snapper don't even go on a kickoff. On a kickoff. Just imagine. Yeah. They, 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 they never have to run full speed. <laughs> never. Just make sure the never. snap get there. Snap is there. He only mm-hmm. got two jobs for field goal and punt. Let's imagine you don't you a long snapper and you're not even on special teams. You're not even on kickoff return. You're not even on kickoff. <laughs> Just imagine that. Owen, let me let me tell you this. So we are in preseason camp. Two a days, full pads, like we going. The the kickers and the long snappers are talking about where they gonna golf at later on. <laughs> yeah. So you that you that kick- lets you that tell you everything you need to know. There you go. Yeah. Um, um since you mentioned kickoff, do you guys like the new kickoff? No. No, oh, wow. Not okay. Like I want them to go back to the original. Yeah, I mean, this if one it ain't, like if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Yeah, it was it was a little broke, wasn't it? Though, like it, it was just like they kick it into the end zone every time, and it's a touchback. It was never like, broke. Know, it was never broke. Hey, at okay. one at some point in time, you're not gonna be able to kick it in the end zone, especially out here at Soldier Field in Chicago. You can't oh, kick through the wind. Just can't. Cold, so like mm-hmm. cold, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. Bro. Um. Um. You know, there a lot of teams have been like all in on like they're basically like getting a, a big quarterback like we saw that in Carolina it didn't work out Cleveland's having these issues obviously sometimes it does work out I'm wondering if you guys think the NFL is like a little too focused on like finding the next Mahomes basically hmm. 
Like, like are we like I, I'm thinking about like the 49ers who have this really balanced team and and they're great. Um, and then you've got like KC who's got Mahomes, and you've got a few like superstar led teams. But I feel like teams right now are maybe like just like going all in on like their one guy and hoping it works out. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. I think uh it's it's not more so the NFL, it's more like teams just being desperate. And you know, they they looking for that one guy that's gonna change everything. And sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. And you know, that's just the uh that's the gamble that they're willing to take. But some coaches, they kind of they they see it before it actually happens. And some 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 coaches are really good scouts. Some coaches are 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 really good in, in analyzing the, the talent that they have. Now, if you're a really good coach, you'll be able to see that, hey, I don't think this number one pick can take us to the promised land. So we're going to have him sit and learn from some of the tops in the games on how to be a professional, on how to carry yourself, on how to go through your reads, on how to read the playbook, on how to read defenses and things like that. And once you've done everything that you can in your power to see if this number one pick is 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 worthy enough to go out on the field and has the respect of his teammates then you put him out there if you've done everything you could possibly do but if not and there's still some signs of him like not like fully grasping the offense or the locker room then you sit him and you you make him wait and you make him hungry and you create that villain story where you're like oh my first year I didn't start so I had to wait in the wings and I had to take notes and blah 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 like then you put him out on the field I think people are just looking for that one person to say hey this guy's going to carry us and we're going to take him in our number, our number one overall pick. Sometimes it's not fair to that player. To, and they need to, mm -hmm. they need to develop a little bit more. Huge thanks to Jamal Charles and Spice Adams for coming on the show. Now it's time for FOS Tomorrow, where we look ahead to the biggest stories on the horizon on the business of sports. After Argentina's 6-0 thrashing of Bolivia in a World Cup qualifier match, one in which Lionel Messi had a hat trick and two assists, the soccer superstar alluded that the games he's playing now, quote, can be my last games. The 37-year-old said, I didn't set any date or deadline about my future. I'm just enjoying all this. I am more emotional than ever and taking all the love from the people because I know these can be my last games. While Messi's comments certainly suggest that he's open to helping Argentina defend its World Cup title, we may be seeing the face of soccer's retirement sooner rather than later. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend or give us a shout out on social media. And if you're on YouTube and you made it this far, take two seconds, hit the like button. We'd appreciate it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.